morning. Morning. Good 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 morning. Well, we once again to our study of the parables of Jesus. <coughs> Someone want to open us with prayer, please? Go ahead. Yes, ma'am. between those two uh, virgin versions. And Luke, uh, Luke includes some uh, additional information that's not set forth in Matthew about the citizens of the kingdom that, uh, that uh, had petitioned the, the, uh, that they did not want this particular person ruling over them. And I made reference to, the, to that, that apparently being uh, referring to a, uh, an actual historical event. And I reached for my book with my briefcase, and lo and behold, I brought the wrong book, which had, which had set forth the details of that, of that uh, event. Uh, I got that uh, reference from uh, Barclay's Daily Bible Study series, uh, which is uh, well-recognized and very popular. Uh, but this week, I brought the right book. And so with the correct information, I'll set that forth to complete our study of the parable of the tenants. This is unique among the parables of Jesus because it is the only one whose story is in part based on an actual historical event. It tells about a king who went away to receive a kingdom and whose subjects did their best to stop him receiving it. When Herod the Great died in 4 BC, he left his king kingdom divided between Herod Antipas, Herod Philip, and Archelaus. That division had to be ratified by the Romans, who were the overlords of Palestine before it became effective. Archelaus, to whom Judea had been left, went to Rome to persuade Augustus to allow him to enter into his inheritance, whereupon the Jews sent an embassy of 50 men to Rome to inform Augustus that they did not wish to have him as king. In point of fact, Augustus confirmed him in his inheritance, though without the actual title of king. Anyone in Judea, on hearing the parable, would immediately remember the historical circumstances on which it was based. So that, uh, that's the host, that historical event to which uh, Barclay believes that the gospel that Luke was referring to, uh, and that sounds pretty persuasive. So I wanted to complete that, that portion of our study from last week. With that, uh, total tying up that detail then, are there any questions on the parable of the talents or the parable of the minna lingering from our discussion last week? All right, thank you. Then we'll move right along to the parable of the sheep, of the sheep and the goats. And uh, we uh, read that parable I recall when we were uh, when, when we were here uh, from Matthew chapter 25 verses 31 through 46, 
And uh, uh, but I think we need to read that again. Uh, someone want to read Matthew 25, 31 to 46 once again? Yeah. Let me let me get let Deacon Barber read it, okay? But I think I think we read it right here last week, so. This is the one I have trouble with. Okay. Don't we all? No, I I literally broken into tears over this, this particular story. Okay. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people, one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did you see we see you, a stranger, invite you in or needed clothes or clothed you? When did you see, when did we see the sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did, for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger and needed clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did not do for the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment for the righteous to eternity. Thank you. It's scary. It, it is. It is. Uh, it is scary. Uh, a thought that I had when I read this parable, and, and, and again, I'm working from the the. Uh, Outline, analytical outline sheet that I that I uh, uh, handed out at the beginning to consider first the possible allegorical interpretations for this parable, and, and I and I uh, looked at it and I thought, you know, I know everybody calls this a parable. It's always been called a parable, but the only part of it that's a parable is verse 33 and 34, and he will place the sheep on his right and the goats on the left. Then the kid, well, I'm sorry. 32b and 33. He will separate people from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right and the goats on the left. That's the only part of it. The rest of it is a word picture of what the, the judgment, uh, the place of judgment will be like in that, in that throne room. Uh, the Son of Man in His glory, all the angels with Him, sitting on His throne, before Him will be gathered all the nation. The, the, the sea itself, there's a word picture there. You, 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 in your mind, you look at, you have the idea of some, of some sort of throne room, uh, and, and everybody entering, and, and some going to the right, and some going to the left. And that's, th those kinds of details are important to us because we, we think in concrete, practical, at least in concrete terms, to the extent of we want to know the mechanics of how this is going to work. Uh, and of course, dimensions of time and space 
may not have, but probably don't mean a thing in terms of what, what's, what's going to happen at, at that point. But the, but the only part that's really a, a parable about which there's any allegorical stuff is the, the, uh, the, the, uh, I keep getting into the, the, the metaphor, or is it a simile? I, I, I often get them confused. That he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goat. And he will place the sheep on his right and the goats on the left. Now, now I don't I don't know that, that that the inclusion of that verse and a half really adds anything to that, unless there's something, some distinction between sheep and goats that 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 perhaps the more agrarian or agricultural among you. Uh, might, uh, might be aware of. Do you have any 4-H graduates here uh, that, that, that don't understand the difference between sheep and goats? <laughs> How about cattle? <laughs> How about cattle? Uh, 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 well, <laughs> ha having no first-hand information, I'll, I'll make reference to my, uh, my internet search. And, and indeed, if you Google search differences between sheep and goats, you get a you get a uh, you get a worksheet. The uh, and, and there are lots of differences. The first difference is to how the uh, sheep and the goats look. The goat's more slender of the two, while the sheep is tubbier. A sheep gives us wool. The goat does not. In the West, sheep meat is eaten, whereas in the Middle East and the Indian subcontinent, continent, a goat is eaten. None of these differences seem to plug into the the parable in Not any way. Milk and cheese. Milk and cheese. Well, yeah, yes. Uh, goats. Uh, a goat's tail, for the most part, stands up while a sheep's tail hangs down. Wow. <laughs> yeah, their eating habits are distinct. A goat is a typical browser, feeding on leaves, shrubs, twigs, and vines. The sheep, on the other hand, loves to graze on the grass and clover. And then I come up to, go ahead, Mark. I guess I, somewhere along the line, I heard that it had more to do with interbreeding um, and keeping them separate or uh, adulterating, um, spoiling. I don't know any other things. That's cheap way to interbreed. A goats and sheep interbreeding. Well, they may. Uh, I don't know that we uh, that we go there. Uh, that, that, that that's set forth in my information sheet, but well, no reason to think otherwise. Yes, ma'am. What about the idea that we sometimes have that goats are stubborn and uh, oh, let me say, more, a little more independent, and sheep are more sheep are more followers, like. You're, 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 going, you're hitting the, the, what I think is the nail on the head, and that's the next part of my information sheet. Goats are curious by nature and are quite independent. A sheep, on the other hand, prefers to stay put in its flock. Okay? Goats are wanderers, independent <coughs> rangers. Sheep stay put in the flock. Now that seems to fit, okay, what we have here. Uh, there are some differences in their upper, the construction of their upper lips and their horns uh, as to which is dominant. A goat has hair, a sheep has fleece. Uh, wild goats are found in abundance, but sheep are entirely domesticated. That made me think, well, we have, as a game animal in this state, Rocky Mountain bighorn sheep. Uh, but I don't know if that's a, really a sheep or a goat. In any event, and that may be, may be the, uh, the uh, exception that the proves rule. Uh, sheep are entirely domesticated, suggesting they have a greater symbiotic relationship with humankind. Uh, so, so uh, the, the, uh, a goat has a beard while a sheep has a mane. I, I, I think the biggest difference is that, is that you find Goats independently, you find sheep in a flock. That, that, that may be, that, that seems to me to be the major difference that fits the uh, usage 
in the parable. Uh, perhaps someone that, uh, if you know someone that, that uh, has firsthand familiarity with sheep and ghosts, they can, uh, they can amplify that or have, have something to do that. But that's, and I, and I don't mean to detract from the, 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 uh, the, the, the drama of the, of the uh, picture that's painted by Jesus. The sheep and goats kinds, kinds of adds to that, um, but I don't know that it adds, adds that much. What, what's really, what's really uh, dramatic about it, what's pretty scary about it, is, is the separation of one from the other. And, and, then, and then when we learn what the uh, criteria you know, used for making that separation is, that gets, that gets even, uh, even more challenging. All right, uh, and, and note, note that this is, yes. Uh, recently I found out that this parable is an excellent illustration uh, of what Jesus must have meant when he said, <coughs> as my heavenly father. Uh, I read a treatise from a cynical theologian who identified this parable as the one of the exterior acts of perfection. Uh, in other words, uh, take care of all that's around you, especially those who are in need. And uh, then you would answer Jesus' command, be perfect as your heavenly father. Get out there and take care of others. But is, it, is that, I wonder, is that is that perfection a matter of our actions? Or is it a matter of our heart? I think it's a matter of action. He wasn't, uh, I don't think Jesus was interested in what was going on in your mind as much as he was interested in what you did with your fellow men and women and children and all those who are in need today in society. And this parable specifies, goes directly at that command. And uh, the penalty was you're going to be separated at the final judgment. But, but and this is this is an important. I uh, sort of keep following up with this because then I, I think it's in a, you're hitting in, a, in a, an area of, of great importance. I have to question what what do you do then with the uh, with the uh, uh, I, think it's, I think it's back in Matthew chapter seven about. Uh, On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. And I, 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 don't, want to, I don't want to reduce this to the works versus faith debate, which has been going on for centuries and centuries, of course, but, but, but out, of, out of our hearts, Proceed the motivation to do the things that evidence the status of our heart and the, and the uh, fullness of our faith. Okay, uh, and of course, you, without well, what I hear from this parable of the sheep and the ghosts is that without without uh, ministering to our brothers and sisters, it doesn't look like our hearts in very good shape. Okay, but, but but where? I mean, how do you motivate people? to do those sorts of things, to minister to their brothers and sisters, other than uh, through ch changing hearts. Because uh, where I'm going with that, let me take a step further, it, it, seems that, it seems that the perfection that is being sought is the perfection of our love. Uh, and, and there's, there's uh, I think it's in James that talks about perfect love cast out fear. I think a lot of the reason we're reluctant to do some of the things in ministry that are described in this parable is because of our fear. Fear of people that are different, fear of somehow risk to ourselves, fear of having to change, uh, different kinds of fear. And, and, and the perfect love that we get uh, through, a, through the new heart and the new spirit that is promised uh, uh, is, is what casts out that fear. And we may, we may, we're going to get to the same end, I 
think, Anthony, but um, but, but I'm going at it a little different way. I, I, are you comfortable with that? No, I'm uncomfortable because I think the emphasis if you interior, interiorize love, I think you've defeated the whole purpose of the Jesus command, love one another. And the best thing that I found was that love is the gift of self. Doing something, being something, being there and being with others there. Not something interior to your mind, because that doesn't get you anywhere. Well, then what is it that changes a person from a self-focused, self-centered, self-concerned person to a person who is other-concerned? By doing something, getting out there and hustling. Uh, and, and okay. what, 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 what motivates the person to make those changes, to do those things? Well, that's the mystery of uh, grace. I can't explain that. Comes and comes as a gift from Almighty God. I can pray for a, a, a change of heart and do all kinds of other things interiorly, but if I don't manifest that with the people I meet, and I can see, and feel, and touch, I'm, I'm a phony. But what, what, what I'm trying to find out, what I'm trying to learn is, is how are you uncomfortable with the, with the idea that, that that change of heart is is what God's grace is all about. Yeah, I, I agree with that. You're, you're okay with that. But if I have somebody that needs something, and I go to him and I say, well, I, feel, I feel all kinds of feelings toward that person, and I keep my hands in my pocket and I walk away, I haven't done anything but, but, good. And, and love is an active verb as far as I'm concerned. No question about okay. that. Okay, okay. And, and, and this parable certainly makes that more clear. abundantly clear. Uh, That's I'll sure. Okay. Uh, yes, we can um, I, I always saw it as accountability. You know, I mean, it's a reminder that we're accountable to each other. And to love is, is, is an action word for me. As long as you don't say we're accountable to the government. I'm no, 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 no. <laughs> accountable to God. You know, when did I see you? You know, that it... it it, uh, the action was already in place. You did this. And, I, and, and you hear Jesus coming back and saying, the person saying, well, when did I see you? When did I see you? Did I, I didn't do this. And, and, and see, that, that's an important point. In the picture that's painted in this parable, the people that are doing the ministry are doing it for the brownie point. That's right. they, they're, not, they're not conscious that they're going to be accountable for it. Okay, that, that's why I'm more comfortable with the idea that this is this is what's proceeding from the heart. Okay? They're doing it because they have a changed heart that's full of the love of God to the point of overflowing. Okay, it's almost like a parent who says to a child, um, "Oh, that was wonderful." What? It, I mean, the teaching of the parent to a child is so wonderful when you see it the child reacting action. <laughs> Absolutely. And so as a parent, for God, the parent is saying to the people, you did a beautiful thing. When, when you did this, you fed, you clothed, you took care of brothers and sisters. And the person going, wait, what did I do? And it becomes commonplace for that, that, that person. A matter of habit. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it's not a habit, it comes from, from, from God as a gift, and it returns to God as a gift. Similarly, the people that fail to minister to others, did, for whatever reason, didn't see the need, and, and, or certainly didn't see it as being Jesus, as being a brother or sister to Jesus, for whatever reason. But, it's it's clear it's, this is when the Son of Man come. And, and I think this was one of our early on uh, uh, lessons uh, or questions. Does any, anybody have any any issue or any quarrel with the fact that he's coming again? That he's going to come again. We don't know when, but he will. He will come. Be ready. That's right. When, not if. Plenty of, plenty of studies we've done. Plenty of parables we've looked at that uh, to talk about. It's going to be a time when we least expected.
Now, uh, who are the uh, brothers and sisters that, is refer that are referred to in uh, <coughs> verse 40? In the, did G the king will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did unto one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Is that uh, is that refer to uh, to believers? Is that uh, people of the church? Is that the whole world? Yep. Whole world. Yep. Everybody, everybody's a brother and sister, whether they like it or not. Right. Whether they know it or not. Right. Okay. In, in, interestingly, in the you know, on down in verse uh, forty-five. Truly, as I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these. Uh, and I guess that's a, 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 a <coughs> footnote as to translation, brothers and sisters. It's not, not included in the text in, in that verse as it is up above. You did it not to me. The, uh, footnotes in study Bibles are important, but you've got to be careful with them. We've talked about that. Uh, and, and this this follows up uh, follows up with our discussion a moment ago, Anthony. Uh, in the context of the parable, the least of these refers to those who are most needy among Jesus' brethren. The reference most likely to Jesus' disciples and, by extension, all believers. The sheep are commended for their great compassion for those in need, for the hungry, the first and the those who are naked, sick, and in prison. Righteous will inherit the kingdom not because of the compassion works that they have done, but because of their righteousness, because the righteousness comes from their transformed hearts in response to Jesus' proclamation of the kingdom, as evidenced by their compassion for the least of these. Caring for those in need, the righteous discover that their acts of compassion for the needy are the same as if done for Jesus himself. No doubt anybody here. If we saw Jesus in need, we would respond to that need. And Jesus is saying, if you see anybody, even those you don't know who are nameless, faceless, homeless, maybe even soulless in your eye, that that is one of my brothers and sisters. And we need to treat him the same as him or her, the same as you will uh, uh, treat me. Right. And of course, uh, who, who my brother is is going to be the subject of a parable we'll discuss in a uh, either today if we get to it or next week uh, in the parable of the Good Samaritan. Uh, and when the lawyer was trying to pin Jesus down as to what uh, uh, who, is, who is his brother, and Jesus told him who was his brother, he would, he would include the Samaritan. And of course, if you, if you can imagine any any group that you find absolutely the most repulsive of any group that you know, that's what's intended by the Samaritan in that, in that, uh, in that parable. Uh, there, uh, I learned some time ago that, that uh, actually from two totally different paths, but, but there, there, there's a place in Albuquerque that, that, that does treatment for, uh, for child sex offenders. Uh, it's kind of a kind of a group home setting. Uh, 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 I, I'm not sure how secure it is, but but uh, it, it's where the state and, and the Department of Corrections do the treatment regimen for child sex offenders, child molesters. Okay, uh, and, and uh, I uh, uh, by a totally different path, I learned that that this uh, particular Christian group. It's not a cult. It's a Christian group. It's a group that, that, that does that does some some, uh, some some pretty aggressive street preaching and door to door ministry. Uh, uh, they're the ones that will be in the in the Christmas parade with a loudspeaker, uh, shouting out how you need to be saved, how judgment is coming, and, and, and it's, it's it's almost as loud as the as the guys going down the street in their low riders with the bass speakers that are as big as a garage door, okay? But yet those people, that, that church, does ministry to 
the folks at the treatment center the child was. They're, because because that, they're included in the least of it. As abhorrent as the idea of child molesters is to most of them. And I can't think of a, of a group that we would, that we would abhor more. You, you could still do hate speech for child molesters, and nobody will raise an eyebrow. Okay? Neither in our culture. But there are folks that minister to those people, and they're alone. It's, it's tough stuff, scary stuff, uh, and, and challenging, very challenging material for us. Okay. Questions, comments so far? It's not, not easy. I mean, you, you, you probably can't envision yourself sitting down and having a cup of coffee with someone who's a convicted child. But, Jesus went up the cross for that person to say he's good for All right. Uh, all nations are included. All nations. No exception. Uh, hard to include ISIS in that. <laughs> yeah. it. Sure did. Sure did. And, and, and you know what? You, what? How, how can you turn the other cheek when somebody's coming at you with a scimitar or a machete or, or, or as broad as AK-47? You know, I, I'm sorry, Lord, but but I believe that the, the uh, scripture supports the right of self-defense, the defense of my family, and so uh, you know I believe that that, uh, that it's okay to shoot back. But I also believe that there are times when we're going to be called to turn the other cheek. That, 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 those aren't mutually exclusive responses. Uh, they are, they are led, led by the Spirit. Tough issue. Okay, what, what other scriptural passages or stories does this parable bring to mind for you? What, one of the first ones we studied was the parable of the wheat and the tares. Okay, they talked about the, the judgment day and that the wheat would be gathered in, the tares would be would be burnt. Parallel situation that we have here. Any other that uh, come to mind? I'm gonna I'm gonna refer you to the uh, it's called the parable of the dragnet. But it's uh, in Matthew chapter 13, starting with verse 47. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that is thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. When it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into containers, but threw away the bad. So it will be at the close of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Anybody have any question about the fact that there is a place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth? Anybody struggle with the idea that a loving God couldn't send people to a place like that? that that's, a, that's a common question for people that don't know about it. How can a loving God condemn somebody to hell? Have you asked that question of, of yourself? Well, as far as I'm thinking, when people are living, they have a choice. In other words, God doesn't make you want to be a Christian or to love him. And so it was their choice on this earth. And if they chose not to follow him, he is the one that makes the decision. Yeah, that, that, that's where C.S. Lewis is with. You see, there isn't anybody 
in hell that didn't, that didn't make the choice to go there. When we choose to reject the gospel, the scripture seems to be pretty clear on what the consequences of that choice are. Now that, that I, I, I have members that are very, members of my family that are very close to me that, that, that have rejected the gospel. And it terrifies me. But, but it, 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 as much as I love those people, I, 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 I can't change what scripture said. Barbara, you're struggling with it. No, I'm not. It, it, it brings back um, a particular client of mine. And it goes back 20 years. Um, and I would learn later that the client had been so badly abused in her home as a child. Uh, but in the end, I was the one who witnessed the abuse to her own children and found another place for them. And, uh, it, I mean, it's a, it's a long story. And it, the only reason it popped up is that two days ago, she popped up on my Facebook, which was very interesting. I haven't responded. But she found me. Um, and she had gone through such abuse as a child, even being sold by her father. And you, and you look at some of the stuff she did, and I, and I just can't imagine her being banned to hell um, when it wasn't, it, it was perpetrated upon her. Say, there's always a circumstance that, that bothers you the most. Although she was baptized in the parish that I am, that I served, she was baptized, and so that she, I, I don't know where she is. I don't know the circumstances. It's two thousand miles away to check, her. and I can't help but think that you run into that same judgment. Not as a priest, but as a, as a judge. <laughs> and yes, we're all of the above. Um, and, and I'm thinking, to, to bring this home a little closer, of, of the victims of abuse by the clergy and by the church. That, that, that uh, uh, of, of, of people, of young people, that, that had an otherwise healthy relationship with the Lord. Uh, and, 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 and what what that what that did to their lives, uh, and, and perhaps the, the generational impact of it. But you know, those 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 people have had difficulty even driving. Some of those people may very well have difficulty even driving past a church building, let alone going into a church building. And, and, and uh, that that. That, that presents some real, real problems. Are those people electing to turn their back on the love of the Lord? Well, the love of the Lord that they've seen has been abusive. Has been, been horrible. Of course, we know it's not the love of the Lord, and that everything done by the church isn't correct. But it makes it difficult for me to buy into a church doctrine that says that you are condemned to hell without the benefit of the sacraments of the church. That you can't be buried in a church cemetery in sacred ground unless you have had a funeral for the church. You're a person that, that has rejected the church because the church rejected you. Uh, uh, that's a little bit off, off, off the topic, but, but, but we, when we, when we you know, spread the love of the Lord to people who have been wounded, we find all kinds of wounds that we need to minister to. And we need to take, we need to take the risk of going there. And, and I, I can't apologize for the church. I can't justify the mistakes of the church, the abuses of the church. You know, all, all I can say is that, that you know, the church is made up of imperfect people just like you and me. And that, you know, let, let's try, try to walk together and see if we can find a place along our journey that, that helps fill up your reservoir of love so that it can begin once again to overflow.
sometimes that's helpful, sometimes it's not. But there, there, you know, people, people who are wounded have difficulty, great difficulty recovering sometimes. And we need to be part of the recovery process and not part of the condemnation process. And, and that's really what, what the people that are ministering to the child sex offenders are really trying to do. Is, is, is to bring the love of the Lord to people that have been rejected by everyone. And we may very well be standing on part of all nations, the sheep and the goats, and, and, and one image that comes to mind is that we, we'll talk about it in one of the other parables, is we're not standing in line there, we're standing side by side. So there's not a first and a last. We're all standing side by side. And, and, and pray that we're holding hands with uh, our brother or sister before us. I think that would be expected of us no matter who that he or she might be. And hopefully we'll have forgiven them. Not necessarily trust them again. Questions? Yes, sir? Isn't that right? Why we have in the Bible that he will judge us? He will take some of those things in consideration. Did you take things into consideration when you were judged? Absolutely. Uh, and and uh, I think I made a wisecrack that when people wanted mercy when I was wearing a black robe, I'd tell them to come to church on Sunday. And, and, and then we talked about mercy then, but today we're talking about justice. And there is, there is a different, uh, a, a different uh, that's a different similar criteria but different tools to work with uh, for, for different purposes and, and, and certainly not the, uh, the depth and inerrancy of discernment that we'll see uh, as the final judgment. Yeah, you do the best with what you can and you uh, want and, and from that. Absolutely. And, and I, I think we're talking about about uh, ways in which this parable might be applicable today uh, with, with uh, folks that, uh, uh, that we undermine, otherwise uh, would avoid uh, how, how we deal with the problem of the homeless, uh, how we respond to beggars on the street corner, uh, how do we respond to those in Calcutta? Despite how this is worded, we're not all called, gifted, or equipped to be a Mother Teresa. Okay, but we are called to bloom where we are planted, as the saying goes, and not, and not, uh, not, not resist blooming. Um, there's much more going on uh, with border ministry in the church, uh, and I'm you know, thankful for that. I know you, this church community is very supportive of that as well, and, and let's hope that it will be, it will continue to stay halfway safe to do border ministry. Uh, in, in the future time. Okay. Other questions on this uh, on this parable, on how the, how the parable might be applicable today. Is anybody in here comfortable with this parable? <laughs> I'm sure not. Uh, if you were a goat, you might. No, absolutely. Uh, but, but I don't know if I have, if I have the requisite genes to fall in the sheep class instead of the goat class. I, I, I'm pretty dead gum independent sometimes. <laughs> pretty, pretty often, actually. <laughs> And so what, what, what about the impact of the, of the parable on you? Sir? Are we qualified to say who's a sheep and who's a goat? I'll tell you a story. Up at home, two periods at our church in Fayette where the donors went home. A lady was married to one of my father's good friends. He was a bartender. He owned a bar. And his wife was a Baptist and she came to the church. Dr. Barrett one day sat down with her and told her, we don't need your money. 
we don't need anything from you. We don't need you. All right. Lovely. That's lovely, isn't it? Now, about that to happen. Now, Bobby won't remember that. He's too young. But my father told me that's it. And, and, and see, that, unfortunately, that's, that is one of the risks if we buy into that model of the church. That the church is supposed to be a place where you, when you become a member, you're expected to, to, uh, to meet certain standards of behavior. Because if you don't meet those standards of behavior, then you're not a proper witness for the gospel. It doesn't reflect your changed heart. Okay. Uh, and so what you do with, with people that, that, are, that don't model that behavior or, as our prayer book says, are leading a notoriously sinful life, that, you, that, that those people are out of fellowship, they're out of the church, they refuse communion until they, till they go straight. Yes, sir? Jesus said he came for sinners. Absolutely. And see, that's the other... The other model of the church is that the church is a place where all are welcome. All are welcome. Radical inclusion. Okay? We, we've heard a lot about radical inclusion over the past several years in the church. And, and, and it, it's caused a, 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 lot of, a lot of difficulty for a lot of people with the idea of radical inclusion. You know, my, my concern is that in, in about, about that, I, I, the gospel is clear about radical inclusion. But the other, the other part of that is is that that there isn't anybody that ever met Jesus that wasn't changed. And he talked about you must be born again, and that's the other side of the, of that equation. That's radical transformation. Radical inclusion, yes. Radical inclusion. You can't, you can't say that there's not radical inclusion with it. I, I can't bring to the foot of the cross all of me, but say, okay, change any part of me but this. Any part of me except this. There's, there's the old story, I think, I think wasn't it, uh, I'm trying to think of who the mythical character was that, uh, with, with the, uh, it wasn't Ulysses. Was it with, it, with, it, with the sword? And when he when he was dipped in the waters of baptism, he, he kept his sword hand out because he didn't want to the, the, he, basically because he wanted to continue to be able to use that in his war. It wasn't Ulysses? I'm trying to think of who it was. Uh, but but it, and all of those Achilles was held his heel. Okay, when, when Achilles went into the waters, he was held by his heel, and that's where the wound came. And warriors. When they were later baptized, would keep their sword hand out. The, the story used to be that when Episcopalians went down to the waters of baptism, they would hold their wallet out in their hand. Okay. And unfortunately, now we're to the point where when people go want to go down to the waters of baptism, they want to hold their genitals because they're saying that that, that the gospel has nothing to say to me about sexuality. Any sexuality is okay. You know, it's a lot easier to hold your wallet out than it is to hold your genitals out, okay? I just don't think we can go to the foot of the cross and say, Lord, you can change me any way you want. Just don't change my sexuality. And that's not pointed at just the, 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 the gay and lesbian crowd, okay? This is a much bigger question than that. This is a question of, uh, of, of what... what what radical transformation means? What it means to come to the foot of the cross? J Jesus told the rich young ruler that he had to sell all his stuff. Okay, and what what is richest? What what's most important to you that you don't want to change? Is it the riches? Is it your sexuality? Is it your pocketbook? Is it your sword hand? Well, you know, take your choice of what it is. You can't hold back anything when you go to the foot of the cross. So, so, yes, yes, radical inclusion. Everybody is welcome. All are welcome at the church. Okay. But, but when we start telling people you have to change, that the God will change your heart, uh, but there's certain things you'll leave alone, 
because it's okay, then I think we're treading on dangerous ground. That, that's where uh, others may obviously disagree with that. We'll talk about that in a different term, but I think that's part of what, uh, what radical transformation is about. Okay. All right. Other impact of the curve. Maybe we're a little beyond the impact of that curve. Let me get off on things with uh, where we are. Okay, questions? Everybody comfortable? I hope you're not too comfortable. This is this is tough stuff. No, I think this is uh, a good part. I would uh, I would uh, applaud Jesus for having said this one. Uh, he'd be glad to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is uh, this is uh, stuff from so. He's been talking. But we need to hear it. Now, uh, we've concluded looking at several parables in chapter 24 and 25 of Matthew, the uh, Herodia parables, uh, that are all about the, uh, the uh, final judgment, the end times, uh, and what's going to happen with that. Um, and, and clearly, it's going to happen. He's coming back. Uh, there are there are a lot of people who who uh, who spend a lot of time uh, studying and trying to discern the when and the how uh, that, of, that, of that second coming will be. Uh, and and uh, I'm not going to go off into any any discussion any discussion of that um, other than to point you to a uh, uh, a good study Bible uh, or a good uh, treatise uh, on uh, I was looking for the oh here it is uh, looking for the reference in this in this ESV study Bible. Uh, that, uh, that summarizes, and this is in the introduction to the book of Revelation, that summarizes the schools of interpreting Revelation by the understanding of their relationship to the visions to one another, in relation to visions to the events of history, what the end times is going to look like, what, what, what those images mean for Revelation, uh, and, and things like you hear about the rapture, about the tribulation, whether you believe in a pre-tribulation rapture or post-tribulation rapture, uh, millennial views, pre-millennialism, those sorts of things. Um, uh, in, in my limited familiarity with it, uh, the uh, summary of the schools of interpretation that I found, four schools of interpretation and four approaches in this ESB study Bible seems pretty enlightening. Uh, and, and then you'll uh, then you'll learn what it means to be a dispensationalist. Okay? And there's a that's a whole other study. Uh, if you want to go there, I commend that to you. I'm not um, I'm not going to go there in this study because it's beyond the scope of uh, of what we're doing with parables. Um, and so I commend that to you. I don't I'm not uh, that well schooled on it myself that I can. Uh, that I can give you a quick and dirty summary that will make any uh, will make any sense. Okay. So I'll commend that to you if, if, if your curiosity is piqued as to uh, what folks think about the when and the how, uh, as opposed to just that it's going to happen and we're called to be ready. All right. Next, any, any questions then about those series of, of, of five five parables? Uh, Perosia parables. Uh, fig tree, and faithful wise servant, the ten virgins, the talents, the sheep, and the goats. It's taken us a while to get through it, but it's a uh, that's an important story. 
Okay, thank you. Let's, let's go next to the uh, parable of the faithful, of the wise and foolish builders. This is in Matthew uh, chapter 7, uh, verses 24 and 27. And I'll ask if there's a if there's someone who can read Matthew 24 27 for you. Matthew 20, Matthew 7, verses 24 to 27. Go ahead, Donnie, please. John, John, you turn this way. Oh, read like this. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Otherwise, it would be just sound to go up there. Everyone who then who hears the words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on a rock, on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat on the house. And it, but it did not fall, because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like the foolish, a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat against the house, and it fell. And great was the fall of it. Thank you. Yes. There is a uh, parallel in Luke chapter 6. Verses, uh, uh, well, let's start with 46. Well, Luke chapter 6, verse 47. 47 through uh, 49. Luke or Mark? Luke chapter 6, verses uh, 47 through 49. Yes, ma'am. Anyone who comes to me and listens to my words and obeys them, I will show you what he is like. He is like a man who, in building his house, dug deep and laid the foundation on rock. The river flooded over and hit that house but could not shake it because it was well built. But anyone who hears my words and does not obey them, it's like a man who built his house without laying a foundation. When the flood hit that house, it fell at once. And what a terrible crash that was. Okay. Thank you. Uh, differences between the two that you notice? Well, this last one talks about a foundation. The other one talks about a rock. But this is explicit about the foundation. Of this right. Build it on the ground without a foundation, right? Right. Others? In Matthew, uh, it starts out, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like, well, well. Luke starts out, everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show you what it is like. It adds in the concept of coming to Jesus. That, that seemed significant. Matthew, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man. Matt and Luke, everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show you what he is like. Any, any uh, suggestions as to uh, uh, 
what, uh, what that difference is? I think Jesus should have explained a little bit more about the need to know something before you start building. I think this parable could, could have been expanded by him. So when I get to see him, I'm going to suggest that if he tries it again, it might be better to uh, explain more about building, the technique of building. lucky enough to have someone make that suggestion and I found myself in Aristotle's ethics and then later on I found that it was the subject of moral theology, uh, how to live a life on the foundation, uh, practice the virtues, uh, all the virtues and all the good habits that make up those virtues, like prudence, temperance, justice for the So if I get the chance, I'm going to suggest that there's a better way or a more complete way of uh, teaching this lesson than just looking for rocks and build your house on rocks. And, and, and maybe when you're in there with all the goats, you could, uh, you could come <laughs> forward and say, geez, I want to work with you before you go. I'm going to smell like all those goats. Uh, say, I approach the throne. <laughs> Say, wait, uh, in both of these things, it, it says, uh, who calls me Lord, Lord? And in other words, follow my you know, directions, build on the rock, and that. Both of these follow what he has said, and if not, then what else will be available? which is not too good if you're not following what Jesus has told you. Build your house on a rock, not on sand. And then what happens? Absolutely. Absolutely. We need to do the proper soil investigation and build a proper foundation. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and sometimes you uh, find that you're, you're digging down and you, you don't know why you're digging or what you're digging for. And that, uh, any other comments on the differences? Uh, in, in, in Matthew, this is this is a little this difference may be significant, may not. Uh, Matthew's written um, it uses a future tense. Everyone then who hears these words of mine does that will be like a wise man will be like the wise man. Luke, everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show you what he is like. One's the future, one's the present text. I'm not, I'm not sure that that's, again, a significant difference, but, but these are little differences that, that we have to read closely to, uh, to discern. Now, Matthew includes rain and floods and wind, Luke only talks about the stream flood. Matthew of course, uses wisely. With the flood usually comes rain and, and, and wind too. That's bad. Matthew uses the term wise man. Wise man. Correct. We like a wise man, and, 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 and Luke simply says he's like a man who, building his house, dug deep and laid. That describes a good, but thank you. And Matthew says, what was it? Every man who hears my word, that doesn't necessarily mean that the, that, that man is coming to Jesus. But it could be a casual here. And this one is explicit. It says, who comes to me? So Matthew could include somebody that hears the words and does them, whether he's coming to Jesus or not. Well, it casually, does, does well, them out of an ethical foundation. He casually hears of the word. He just casually hears it. Okay. And he, yet he's still building his house on the rock. Interesting. Interesting. Matthew talks about where he built the house on the rock or on the sand. And Luke talks about how 
you built the house with a foundation or without. That may be a distinction that makes a difference, may not be, I'm not, I'm not sure. There are distinctions that don't make differences. Okay, any other differences? Thank you for reading closely. That's, that's part of what we're learning to do here. Okay, possible allegorical interpretations. Who, who, who's a house builder? common that we see young people especially struggling for self-identity. Uh, you know, who am I? What am I? Uh, am I uh, uh, do I measure up to my family's expectations, the school's expectations, my peer group's expectations? Uh, we, we build our self-image on, on uh, beauty, wealth, uh, skills, athletic prowess, financial resources, lots of things we build our self-image on. Uh, which things, of course, can come and go. Wealth can come and go. Athletic prowess can come and go uh, because of injury or something like that. If our self-image is built, however, in, in, on, on the basis that I'm a child of God, uh, that I'm you know, uh, born again uh, and, and I'm, I'm loved, I'm full of the love, of, love of the Lord, and that, that's who I am. That doesn't change. Uh, the bully at school can't change that. The bully in some other location can't change that. Your circumstances can't change. Could, couldn't change it for Joe, no matter what was taken away from it. If, if, if the self-image of a young person is built on their identity as a child of God. Uh, forgive it that, that, that's the chair. That, that's the rock, the foundation. Because there's lots of other ways to approach young people too, but that's but that's one uh, that, that, that uh, sometimes is pretty important. Uh, we can go back and compare the uh, the tree and its fruit in the uh, previous verses uh, in Matthew chapter seven. Beware of, verse 15, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing but are inwardly are ravenous wolves who are recognized by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. That shall recognize them by their fruits. That's another another parable, if you will. Uh, but the fruit is those actions that flow from the words of Jesus. You okay with that? Right. Yeah. Again, to, to continue on with possible allegorical interpretations, the the flood, the wind, the rain, the storm. What's that refer to? Life's tribulations, life's problems. Okay, what, what life throws at? Or does it possibly mean a judgment day? It could be, it could be both, it could be one or the other. Uh, 
I, I, I'm curious as to what your impression is of, as to the last verse. And when the house fell, great was the fall of it. What is it, what is it about the fall of the house that makes that a great fall? The foundation. Does it refer to how big we built the house? When the fall of it was great. Or does it just refer to the fact that it's it, it's completely destroyed? There's nothing left. It was built on shaky ground, was built on sand, so everything the person did. Is... Either, either way, the house, whether it's a big house or a little house, it's washed away. And, and maybe, the, maybe the phrase, the fall of it was great, refers to just how total the destruction was. And we, and that's, that, that brings me back to my, my uh, suggestion that, 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 that the house we're building is what we base our lives on, our self-image. And, and when someone's self-image is shattered, by abuse of some sort, by tragedy, by you know, if it's if it's a house that's not built on the rock, on the foundation, what 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 do we look at when people start descending, when their self-image is shattered, descending into depression, and and ultimately could lead to suicide. Great is the fall of the house. And that's where I'm going with it, with an allegorical interpretation of this. I, I don't know if that, does that seem like it's going too far? When the house is built on the wrong foundation, our self-image is built on the wrong foundation. Okay? Other, other parts of the, uh, or other aspects of the allegorical interpretation of the individual characters in this, uh, Little, little three verse parable in power pack. Barbara, you look like you're struggling with something. Right? I was given this particular passage for one time. One time I worked with um, families that were getting ready to purchase a house for habitat for humanity in Michigan. And uh, the person's pastor fell the rope. They didn't come to at the, at the blessing or sanctioning of their new house. And so I was handed that and said, can you do it? And if the kids, there were four kids, that I used a comparison. I did this uh, with the family and had to sit around taking care of things. But I used three stones and handed the children the stones and told them to remember it. But we're building a foundation of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And to put those, I had magnets on the stones on each of those and that could be put on to, to be remembered. A year later, they told me they remembered it, including the passage. I mean, the passage uh, in Matthew. And it was wonderful because I said, which gospel is this? And he said, the one with the gospel of the three little pigs. <laughs> and I'm thinking of that particular instance where I said, well, what does it mean? He says, you've got to take care of stuff and you've got to prepare for it. You've got to make it good so it doesn't fall down. And they said, well, that's about life. And I thought, these children got it, mm -hmm. yes. you know, but they remembered it not as a as a passage. They remembered it as a gospel of three little kids. So I couldn't. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm no, no, no. But, but that, whatever works, I guess. Well, that, yeah, that, that's that's what we're called to do, particularly with dealing with young people, is it, it, to is to act out these parables the same way as Jesus offered the parables, so well, his disciples will understand it. And, and, and give the sense of the parable to young people in, in, a, in a way that they can understand. Using tangible things is a great way to do that. Uh, and, and, and perfect for the setting. 
I, I think that was inspirational. But, uh, I think it was God given. That's right. Yes. Absolutely, absolutely. God, God used you for a purpose in that, and that's. Uh, we're thankful for those moments when that happened. So, thanks for sharing that. A, a classic example of using using uh, of making a parable come to life uh, for the purpose of teaching. That, that, that's that's why this was in the book. For, for purposes like that. I the find it. Yes, sir. It says now you're on page 1964 in the Bible of Luke. Okay, the footnote. Uh, 6, 40, 46 to 49. Um, page 9. Okay. Okay, build your house on the rock. Two examples illustrate what it means to hear and to do Jesus' words. 47, 48. Okay. And to hear, but not to do them. 49. Confession apart from obedience is worthless. Absolutely. So that's I want to bring that up. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I and I think that uh, and I think that to, to to go back to our previous parable about the sheep and the goats for just a moment. Uh, and, and we didn't we didn't talk about this specifically, but 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 it, it appears like all the nations that were before the throne, that were divided into the sheep and the goats, that nobody there protested that they didn't realize, that they were not aware that, that they were called to minister to the least and the lost and those who are sick and in prison all about. Nobody there protested that they hadn't heard the gospel. And, and, and we, we, we talk about the great about the judgment coming after the gospel has been preached to the ends of the earth and fulfilled the great commission to, to go into all nations. And so that's 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 almost an assumption, if you will, uh, that the time of judgment that everybody there will have heard the gospel and had the opportunity to respond to. It. Now everybody knew what they were supposed to do. Some saw the need and obeyed. Some either didn't see the need, or chose not to see the need, or if they saw the need, didn't do anything. And so, yes, confession without obedience, love is an action word. Confession without obedience uh, is only half the picture, only part of the picture. And so, uh, not, as is in a few verses earlier, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. The goats, were the ones that were calling him Lord, Lord. The sheep were the ones calling him Lord, Lord, and the will of the Father. Yeah. Okay? Good. Yes, ma'am. I was going to say, I like the way in Matthew um, 7, verse 28 and 29, follows up that period. The house builders, when Jesus finished saying these things, the crowd was amazed at the way he taught. He wasn't like the teachers of the law. Instead, he taught with authority. <laughs> right, right. Not, not just platitudes, but uh, the substance. Good. Okay, main, main points. Uh, we, I, we just summarized the, the person who responds to the gospel with obedience will survive God's final judgment intact. The other side of that coin, the person who refuses to follow Christ in discipleship uh, will suffer destruction on that last day. Now, is there any other passages or stories that the parable brings to mind? Deacon Barber shared with us a story that the passage brought to mind from her, uh, her ministry. And of course, it brings to mind the parable of the sheep and the goats and the other, uh, the other parables that we referred to in there. And how might the parable be applicable today? When we, when we first brought, when we first started talking about the uh, uh, allegorical interpretations, uh, we talked about the, who's the house, the builder, the householder, and we kind of agreed that was with me. Can we broaden that at all? Could, could, could the uh, uh, house builder be referring to those who build the church? An individual church community, 
not just a church building, but a church community. Local, Boston, national, international. The foundation needs to be the same, right? And his name is Jesus. You know that. Public education could use this idea. Because public education is designed to literally build a foundation for all these young people so that their lives can be profitable, generous, a whole variety of things that they need in order to survive in a conservative society. And uh, I have heard that they use in this fashion. Is that is that true for secular education as well as oh, yeah. what we call parochial education? Especially secular. You expect it in the church. Because the church has that. We, we certainly would, would expect it in the church. Yeah, you would. Yeah. But it's, it doesn't seem to be uh, uh, active in the thought and the thinking of uh, school officials. Uh, what they're doing is building a foundation each one of these children that are entrusted to their care. Uh, they learn English, they learn, they learn how to speak, they learn how to take care of each other in some ways. Uh, but while they're really concerned with building a foundation for a life. Well, the reason why I say this is that I had an experience in kindergarten. My father had a candy store. I brought candy to school one morning. And Miss Bradford brought me into the cloakroom and she said, Anthony, if you want to bring candy, you have to bring candy for everyone. I said, oh, really, Miss Bradford? And so from then on, on Fridays, my father gave me candy for everyone. And uh, over the years, I realized that uh, Miss Bradford was teaching me something that Jesus tried to teach so many back in the beginning of our, our era. The thought occurred to me that that illustration is something that's missing today in schools. Uh, they equate kindness, and thoughtfulness, and caring as religion, and they're not teaching religion. Well, that's nonsense. The theology was once the queen of the sciences. What happened Amen. to the classics? Yes. Amen. Yeah. So we've come a long way. Down. Yeah, what, what, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. that, that, that's that's a, a great debate to get into as to whether, whether, whether we progress at all. Uh, yes, sir. We need to rewrite the textbooks in Texas and put God back in and put actual history back in because the ones that are printed for Texas are basically the ones that are offered to all the other states. Texas is the king in the textbook. That's where they're doing the printing, the, mm -hmm. the development. So, right. Yeah, so and, we need history back in, and God is in our history. What 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 is, what was the old saying about whoever controls it? It's about communism. Whoever controls your your schools and your education system controls the future of the country. That's yeah. right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And and, 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 you know, to, and to what extent do we teach young people to think independently? To, to do independent thinking, okay? or, or, or is it the school's responsibility to teach what they want to teach, and not teach young people to think independently? Some of the teachers are that way. Well, and, and we, we, I think we all agree that there needs to be a foundation that needs to be on the rock, okay? Uh, but if we if we teach our young people, uh, if we don't teach our young people to to if we don't give them the tools they need to make, they need to have to make decisions independently, then we have failed in some way. And that's risky. That's risky because if we teach young people to think independently and make choices, then we take the risk that they make their own choices. Which, if we don't offer them any other choices, they're probably going to do anyway. We've certainly seen that in, the, in our history in the 60s. Teachers yes, don't do that's why one of this generation sitting in this room, our generation, was the great inventors of all new ideas. I don't think the next generation that are young, just going into school now, 
They're not getting taught the way we were. But, and, and, and I, my knee-jerk reaction is to, is to agree with you wholeheartedly. But then again, I wonder if my dad's generation thought the same thing about our generation. Okay, because there were lots of things that, 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 that in the early part of the 20th century that, that uh, I mean, there were the Industrial Revolution, the scientific, I mean, there were lots of things that came out of that generation that, that they were pretty proud of. My father okay. said he lived in the best of all times. He saw an automobile come in, and he used to pull me nine miles by horse and wagon to the meat market from the slaughterhouse. And he saw the car come in, he saw the man land on the moon. Now, what do you want for a lifetime? Yeah. <laughs> I've seen it all. And, and, and when my dad went to college, 1921 through 1925, what they were doing was they were spiking freshmen in college. That was the thing, spiking the freshmen. <laughs> Interesting. Right, right now, though, I consider dumbing down because if the electricity went off and you wanted to pay cash at the store, they can't even count you back change. <laughs> and we, we were taught in math, you covered it back to the people, laid it in your hand and everything else. Now they can't even make change. Yep. And, if, and I've done it on purpose. I've gone in and after they run it up in the computer, get the over. 13 cents and it follows them up. They don't know what to do. But, but yet, if you hand in my smartphone, they can find things on there that takes me hours to figure That's out. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so what are we... But it doesn't impress them and stay with them. It's just what the kind of monsters have we created? Hi. Uh, next week, we'll start uh, and we'll finish. We'll start with any questions that, that arise from our discussion this week. And then we'll go to the parable of the workers in the vineyard, Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 16, and then do the uh, parable of the Good Samaritan. Workers in the vineyard, the parable of the Good Samaritan, which is in Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. Luke 10, right? Chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. Workers in the vineyard, Matthew 20, verses 1 through 16. Okay. <laughs> let, let us pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, we uh, we rejoice at the richness of what you've given us in, in the Holy Scripture. We rejoice in the richness of what you've done to make that come alive because the scripture all points to you. Help us to come to you, Lord. Help us to live out your call. Help us to be open to your molding and shaping that we might realize the fullness of all you have for us in God's image. Thank you, Lord. Be with us this day and this week. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you.